open your eyes and see around, you will find dozens of applications of machine learning which you are using and interacting with in your daily life. Be it be using the face detection algorithm in Facebook or getting the recommendation for similar products from Amazon. Machine learning is applied almost everywhere. So hello and welcome all to this YouTube session. This is Atul from Edureka and in today's session we'll learn about how to build a decision tree. This session is designed in a way that you get most out of it. All right. So this decision tree is a type of classification algorithm which comes under the supervised learning technique. So before learning about decision tree, I'll give you a short introduction to classification where we'll learn about what is classification, what are its various types, where it is used or what are its use cases. Now once you get your fundamental clear, we'll jump to the decision tree part. Under this, first of all, I'll teach you to mathematically create a decision tree from scratch. Then once you get your concepts clear, we'll see how you can write a decision tree classifier from scratch in Python using the cart algorithm. All right. I hope the agenda is clear to you guys. Fine. So let's move ahead and start with what is classification. I hope every one of you must have used Gmail. So how do you think the mail is getting classified as a spam or not a spam mail? Well, there's nothing but classification. So what it is. Well, classification is the process of dividing the data set into different categories or groups by adding label. In other way, you can say that it is a technique of categorizing the observation into different category. So basically what you're doing is you're taking the data, analyzing it, and on the basis of some condition, you finally divide it into various categories. Now, why do we classify it? Well, we classify it to perform predictive analysis on it. Like when you get the mail, the machine predicts it to be a spam or not a spam mail. And on the basis of that prediction, it adds the irrelevant or spam mail to the respective folder. In general, this classification algorithm handles questions like Is this data belongs to A category or B category? Like, is this a male or is this a female? Something like that. Are you getting it? Okay, fine. Now the question arises Where will you use it? Well, you can use this for fraud detection or to check whether the transaction is genuine or not. Suppose I'm using a credit card here in India. Now due to some reason I had to fly to Dubai. Now if I'm using the credit card over there, I'll get a notification alert regarding my transaction. They would ask me to confirm about the transaction. So this is also kind of predictive analysis as the machine predicts that something fishy is in the transaction as 24 hours ago. I made the transaction using the same credit card in India and 24 hours later the same credit card is being used for the payment in Dubai. So the machine predicts that something fishy is going on in the transaction. So in order to confirm it, it sends you a notification alert. All right. Well, this is one of the use case of classification. You can even use it to classify different items like fruits on the basis of its taste, color, size or weight. A machine well trained using the classification algorithm can easily predict the class or the type of fruit whenever new data is given to it. Not just the fruit, it can be any item. It can be a car, it can be a house, it can be a signboard or anything. Have you noticed that while you visit some sites or you try to log in into some, you get a picture capture for that, right? Where you have to identify whether the given image is of a car or it's of a pole or not. You have to select it. For example, there are 10 images and you're selecting three images out of it. So in a way, you are training the machine, right? You're telling that these three are the picture of a car and rest are not. So who knows you are training it for something big, right? So moving on ahead, let's discuss the types of classification. All right. Well, there are several different ways to perform a same task. Like in order to predict whether a given person is a male or a female, the machine had to be trained first. All right. But there are multiple ways to train the machine and you can choose any one of them. Just for predictive analytics, there are many different techniques, but the most common of them all is the decision tree, which we'll cover in depth in today's session. So as a part of classification algorithm, we have decision tree, random forest, neighbors, k nearest neighbor, logistic regression, linear regression, support vector machines, and so on. There are many. All right. So let me give you an idea about few of them. Starting with decision tree. Well, decision tree is a graphical representation of all the possible solution to a decision. The decisions which are made, they can be explained very easily. For example, here is a task which says that should I go to a restaurant or should I buy a hamburger? You are confused on that. So for that, what you'll do, you'll create a decision tree for it. Starting with the root node will be first of all, you'll check whether you are hungry or not. All right. If you're not hungry, then just go back to sleep, 
right? If you are hungry and you have $25, then you will decide to go to a restaurant. And if you are hungry and you don't have $25, then you will just go and buy a hamburger. That's it. All right. So this is about decision tree. Now moving on ahead, let's see what is a random forest. Well, random forest build multiple decision trees and merges them together to get a more accurate and stable prediction. All right. Most of the time, random forest is trained with a bagging method. The bagging method is based on the idea that the combination of learning model increases the overall result. If you are combining the learning from different models and then clubbing it together, what it will do, it will increase the overall result. Fine. Just one more thing. If the size of your data set is huge, then in that case, one single decision tree would lead to an overfit model. Same way, like a single person might have its own perspective on the complete population, as the population is very huge, right? However, if we implement the voting system and ask different individual to interpret the data, then we would be able to cover the pattern in a much meticulous way. Even from the diagram, you can see that in section A, we have a large training data set. What we do, we first divide our training data set into n subsamples, all right, and we create a decision tree for each subsample. Now, in the B part, what we do, we take the vote out of every decision made by every decision tree. And finally, we club the vote to get the random forest decision. Fine. Let's move on ahead. Next, we have NAEP bias. So NAEP bias is a classification technique which is based on Bayes theorem. It assumes that presence of any particular feature in a class is completely unrelated to the presence of any other feature. NAEP bias is simple and easy to implement algorithm. And due to its simplicity, this algorithm might outperform more complex model when the size of the data set is not large enough. All right. A classical use case of NAEP bias is a document classification. In that, what you do, you determine whether given text corresponds to one or more categories. In the text case, the features used might be the presence or absence of any keyword. So this was about NAEP. From the diagram, you can see that using NAEP bias, we have to decide whether we have a disease or a not. First, what we do, we check the probability of having a disease and not having the disease, right? Probability of having a disease is 0.1, while on the other hand, probability of not having a disease is 0.9. Okay, first let's see when we have disease and we go to the doctor, all right? So when we visited the doctor and the test is positive, so probability of having a positive test when you're having a disease is 0.80 and probability of a negative test when you already have a disease that is 0.20. This is also a false negative statement as the test is detecting negative, but you still have the disease, right? So it's a false negative statement. Now let's move ahead when you don't have the disease at all. So probability of not having a disease is 0.9. And when you visit the doctor and the doctor is like, yes, you have the disease, but you already know that you don't have the disease. So it's a false positive statement. So probability of having a disease when you actually know there is no disease is 0.1. And probability of not having a disease when you actually know there is no disease. So, and the probability of it is around 0.90. Fine. It is same as probability of not having a disease. Even the test is showing the same result. It's a true positive statement. So it is 0.9. All right. So let's move on ahead and discuss about KNN algorithm. So this KNN algorithm or the K nearest neighbor, it stores all the available cases and classifies new cases based on the similarity measure. The K in the KNN algorithm is the nearest neighbor we wish to take vote from. For example, if K equal one, then the object is simply assigned to the class of that single nearest neighbor. From the diagram, you can see the difference in the image when K equal one, K equal three and K equal five, right? Well, the modern systems are now able to use the K nearest neighbor for visual pattern recognition to scan and detect hidden packages in the bottom bin of a shopping cart at the checkout. If an object is detected, which matches exactly to the object listed in the database, then the price of the spotted product could even automatically be added to the customer's bill. While this automated billing practice is not used extensively at this time, but the technology has been developed and is available for use. If you want, you can just use it. And yeah, one more thing. K nearest neighbor is also used in retail to detect patterns in the credit card uses. Many new transaction scrutinizing software application use KNN algorithms to analyze registered data and spot unusual pattern that indicates suspicious activity. 
For example, if register data indicates that a lot of customers information is being entered manually rather than through automated scanning and swapping, then in that case, this could indicate that the employees who are using the register are in fact stealing customers personal information or if a registered data indicates that a particular good is being returned or exchanged multiple times. This could indicate that employees are misusing the return policy or trying to make money from doing the fake returns, right? So this was about KNN algorithm. Fine. Since our main focus for this session will be on decision tree. So starting with what is decision tree? But first let me tell you why did we choose decision tree to start with? Well, these decision tree are really very easy to read and understand. It belongs to one of the few models that are interpretable where you can understand exactly why the classifier has made that particular decision. Right. Let me tell you a fact that for a given data set, you cannot say that this algorithm performs better than that. It's like you cannot say that decision tree is better than neighbors or neighbors is performing better than decision tree. It depends on the data set, right? You have to apply hit and trial method with all the algorithms one by one and then compare the result. The model which gives the best result is the model which you can use it for better accuracy for your data set. All right. So let's start with what is decision tree? Well, a decision tree is a graphical representation of all the possible solution to a decision based on certain conditions. Now you might be wondering why this thing is called as decision tree. Well, it is called so because it starts with a root and then branches off to a number of solution just like a tree, right? Even the tree starts from a root and it starts growing its branches once it gets bigger and bigger. Similarly, in a decision tree, it has a root which keeps on growing with increasing number of decision and the conditions. Now, let me tell you a real life scenario. I won't say that all of you, but most of you must have used it. Remember, whenever you dial the toll free number of your credit card company, it redirects you to his intelligent computerized assistant where it asks you questions like press one for English or press two for Hindi, press three for this, press four for that, right? Now once you select one now again it redirects you to a certain set of questions like press one for this press one for that and similarly right. So this keeps on repeating until you finally get to the right person right. You might think that you are caught in a voicemail hell but what the company was actually doing it was just using a decision tree to get you to the right person. All right. I'd like you to focus on this particular image for a moment on this particular slide. You can see an image where the task is should I accept a new job offer or not. All right, so you have to decide that for that what you did you created a decision tree starting with the base condition or the root node was that the basic salary or the minimum salary should be fifty thousand dollars. If it is not fifty thousand dollar then you are not at all accepting the offer. All right, so if your salary is greater than fifty thousand dollar then you will further check whether the commute is more than one hour or not. If it is more than one hour you will just decline the offer. If it is less than one hour then you are getting closer to accepting the job offer. Then further what you'll do you will check whether the company is offering free coffee or not, right? If the company is not offering the free coffee, then you'll just decline the offer and if it is offering the free coffee then yeah, you will happily accept the offer, right? So this is just an example of a decision tree. Now let's move ahead and understand a decision tree. Well, here is a sample data set that I'll be using it to explain you about the decision tree. All right. In this data set each row is an example and the first two columns provide features or attributes that describes the data and the last column gives the label or the class we want to predict and if you like you can just modify this data by adding additional features and more example and our program will work in exactly the same way fine. Now this data set is pretty straightforward except for one thing. I hope you have noticed that it is not perfectly separable. Let me tell you something more about that. As in the second and fifth examples, they have the same features but different labels. Both have yellow as their color and diameter as three, but the labels are mango and lemon. Fine. Let's move on and see how a decision tree handles this case. All right. In order to build a tree, we'll use a decision tree algorithm called CART. The CART algorithm stands for classification and regression tree algorithm. All right. Let's see a preview of how it works. All right. To begin with, we'll add a root node for the tree and all the nodes receive a list of rows as input and the root will receive the entire training data set. 
Now each node will ask true and false question about one of the feature and in response to that question will split or partition the data set into two different subsets. These subsets then become input to two child node we add to the tree and the goal of the question is to finally unmix the labels as we proceed down or in other words to produce the purest possible distribution of the labels at each node. For example, the input of this node contains only one single type of label. So we could say that it's perfectly unmixed. There is no uncertainty about the type of label as it consists of only grapes, right? On the other hand, the labels in this node are still mixed up. So we would ask another question to further drill it down, right? But before that, we need to understand which question to ask and when. And to do that, we need to quantify how much question helps to unmix the label. And we can quantify the amount of uncertainty at a single node using a metric called Gini impurity. And we can quantify how much a question reduces that uncertainty using a concept called information gain. We'll use these to select the best question to ask at each point. And then what we'll do, we'll iterate the steps, we'll recursively build the tree on each of the new node. We'll continue dividing the data until there are no further question to ask. And finally, we reach to our leaf. All right. All right. So this was about decision tree. So in order to create a decision tree, first of all, what you have to do, you have to identify different set of questions that you can ask to the tree. Like is this color green and what will be these question? These question will be decided by your data set. Like is this color green? Is the diameter greater than or equal to three? Is the color yellow? Right. Questions resembles to your data set. Remember that. All right. So if my color is green, then what it will do, it will divide into two parts. First, the green mango will be in the true, while on the false, we have lemon and the mango. All right. If the color is green or the diameter is greater than or equal to three or the color is yellow. Now let's move on and understand about decision tree terminologies. All right. So starting with root node root node is the base node of a tree. The entire tree starts from a root node. In other words, it is the first node of a tree. It represents the entire population or sample and this entire population is further segregated or divided into two or more homogeneous set. Fine. Next is the leaf node. Well, leaf node is the one when you reach at the end of the tree, right? That is you cannot further segregate it down to any other level. So that is the leaf node. Next is splitting. Splitting is dividing your root node or your node into different sub part on the basis of some condition. All right. Then comes the branch or the subtree. Well, this branch or subtree gets formed when you split the tree. Suppose when you split a root node, it gets divided into two branches or two subtrees, right? Next is the concept of pruning. Well, you can say that pruning is just opposite of splitting. What we are doing here, we are just removing the sub node of a decision tree. We'll see more about pruning later in this session. All right, let's move on ahead. Next is parent or child node. Well, first of all, root node is always the parent node and all other nodes associated with that is known as child node. Well, you can understand it in a way that all the top node belongs to a parent node and all the bottom node which are derived from a top node is a child node. The node producing a further node is a child node and the node which is producing it is a parent node. Simple concept, right? Let's use the cart algorithm and design a tree manually. So first of all, what do you do? You would decide which question to ask and when. So how will you do that? So let's first of all visualize the decision tree. So this is the decision tree which we'll be creating manually. All right. First of all, let's have a look at the data set. You have outlook, temperature, humidity, and windy as your different attributes. On the basis of that, you have to predict that whether you can play or not. So which one among them should you pick first? Answer: Determine the best attribute that classifies the training data. All right. So how will you choose the best attribute or how does a tree decide where to split or how the tree will decide its root node? Well, before we move on and split a tree, there are some terminologies that you should know. All right. First being the Gini index. So what is this Gini index? This Gini index is the measure of impurity or purity used in building a decision tree in cart algorithm. All right. Next is information gain. This information gain is the decrease in entropy after a data set is split on the basis of an attribute. Constructing a decision tree is all about finding an attribute that returns the highest information gain. All right. 
so you'll be selecting the node that would give you the highest information gain all right next is reduction in variance this reduction in variance is an algorithm which is used for continuous target variable or regression problems the split with lower variance is selected as a criteria to split the population see in general term what do you mean by variance variance is how much your data is varying right so if your data is less impure or it is more pure then in that case the variation would be less as all the data are most similar right so this is also a way of splitting a tree the split with lower variance is selected as a criteria to split the population all right next is the chi square G square it is an algorithm which is used to find out the statistical significance between the differences between sub nodes and the parent nodes fine let's move ahead now the main question is how will you decide the best attribute for now just understand that you need to calculate something known as information gain the attribute with the highest information gain is considered the best yeah i know your next question might be like what is this information gain but before we move on and see what exactly information gain is let me first introduce you to a term called entropy because this term will be used in calculating the information gain well entropy is just a metric which measures the impurity of something or in other words you can say that it's the first step to do before you solve the problem of a decision tree as i mentioned here something about impurity so let's move on and understand what is impurity suppose you have a basket full of apples and another bowl which is full of same label which says apple now if you are asked to pick one item from each basket and ball then the probability of getting the apple and its correct label is 1 so in this case you can say that impurity is 0 all right now what if there are four different fruits in the basket and four different labels in the ball then the probability of matching the fruit to a label is obviously not 1 it's something less than that well it could be possible that i picked banana from the basket and when i randomly pick the label from the ball it says a cherry any random permutation and combination can be possible so in this case i would say that impurities is non zero i hope the concept of impurity is clear so coming back to entropy as i said entropy is the measure of impurity from the graph on your left you can see that as the probability is zero or one that is either they are highly impure or they are highly pure then in that case the value of entropy is zero and when the probability is 0.5 then the value of entropy is maximum well what is impurity impurity is the degree of randomness how random a data is so if the data is completely pure in that case the randomness equals 0 or if the data is completely impure even in that case the value of impurity will be 0 question like why is it that the value of entropy is maximum at 0.5 might arise in your mind right so let me discuss about that let me derive it mathematically So as you can see here on the slide the mathematical formula of entropy is minus of probability of yes let's move on and see what this graph has to say mathematically suppose s is our total sample space and it's divided into two parts yes and no like in our data set the result for playing was divided into two parts either yes or no which we have to predict either we have to play or not right so for that particular case you can define the formula of entropy as entropy of total sample space equals negative of probability of yes multiplied by log of probability of yes with a base 2 minus probability of no multiplied by log of probability of no with base 2 where s is your total sample space and p of yes is the probability of yes and p of no is the probability of no well if the number of yes equal number of no that is probability of s equals 0.5 right since you have equal number of yes and no so in that case value of entropy will be 1 just put the value over there all right let me just move to the next slide i'll show you this all right next is if it contains all yes or all no that is probability of a sample space is either 1 or 0 then in that case entropy will be equal to 0 let's see it mathematically one by one so let's start with the first condition where the probability was 0.5 So this is our formula for entropy, right? So this is our first case, right? Which we discussed that when the probability of yes equal probability of no, that is in our data set we have equal number of yes and no, all right? So probability of yes equal probability of no, and that equals 0.5, or in other words, you can say that yes plus no equal to total sample space, all right? Since the probability is 0.5, so when you put the values in the formula, you get something like this. 
and when you calculate it you will get the entropy of the total sample space as one all right let's see for the next case what was the next case either you have total yes or you have total no so if you have total yes let's see the formula when we have total yes so you have all yes and zero no fine so probability of yes equal one and yes is the total sample space obviously so in the formula when you put that thing up you will get entropy of sample space equal negative times of one multiplied by log of one as the value of log one equals zero so the total thing will result to zero similarly is the case with no even in that case you will get the entropy of total sample space as zero so this was all about entropy all right next is what is information gain well information gain what it does it measures the reduction in entropy it decides which attribute should be selected as the decision node if s is our total collection then information gain equals entropy which we calculated just now that minus weighted average multiplied by entropy of each feature don't worry we'll just see how it, to calculate it with an example all right so let's manually build a decision tree for our data set so this is our data set which consists of 14 different instances out of which we have nine yes and five no all right so we have the formula for entropy just put over that since nine yes so total probability of yes equals nine by 14 and total probability of no equals five by 14 and when you put up the value and calculate the result you will get the value of entropy as 0 0.94 all right so this was your first step that is compute the entropy for the entire data set all right now you have to select that out of outlook temperature humidity and windy which of the node should you select as the root node big question right how will you decide that this particular node should be chosen at the base node and on the basis of that only i'll be creating the entire tree how you'll select that let's see so you have to do it one by one you have to calculate the entropy and information gain for all of the different nodes so starting with outlook so outlook has three different parameters sunny overcast and rainy so first of all select how many number of yes and no are there in the case of sunny like when it is sunny how many number of yes and how many number of no's are there so in total we have two yes and three no's in case of sunny in case of overcast we have all yes so if it is overcast then we'll surely go to play it's like that all right and next it is rainy then total number of yes equal three and total number of no equals two fine next what we do we calculate the entropy for each feature for here we are calculating the entropy when outlook equals sunny first of all we are assuming that outlook is our root node and for that we are calculating the information gain for it all right so in order to calculate the information gain remember the formula it was entropy of the total sample space minus weighted average multiplied by entropy of each feature all right so what we are doing here we are calculating the entropy of outlook when it was sunny so total number of yes when it was sunny was two and total number of no that was three fine so let's put up in the formula since the probability of yes is 2 by 5 and the probability of no is 3 by 5 so you will get something like this all right so you are getting the entropy of sunny as 0 0.971 fine next you'll calculate the entropy for overcast when it was overcast remember it was all yes right so the probability of yes equal 1 and when you put over that you'll get the value of entropy as 0 fine and when it was rainy rainy has three yes and two no's so probability of yes in case of sunny is three by five and probability of no in case of sunny is two by five and when you add the value of probability of yes and probability of no to the formula you get the entropy of sunny as 0 0.971 fine now you have to calculate how much information you're getting from outlook that equals weighted average all right so what was this weighted average total number of yes and total number of no fine so information from outlook equals 5 by 14 from where does this 5 came over we are calculating the total number of sample space within that particular outlook when it was sunny right so in case of sunny there was two yes and three no's all right so weighted average for sunny would be equal to 5 by 14 all right since the formula was 5 by 14 multiplied by entropy of each feature all right so as calculated the entropy for sunny is 0 0.971 right so what we'll do we'll multiply 5 by 14 with 0 0.971 right well this was the calculation for information when outlook equals sunny but outlook even equals overcast and rainy for in that case what we'll do 
again similarly we'll calculate for everything for overcast and sunny for overcast weighted average is 4 by 14 multiplied by its entropy that is 0 and for sunny it is same 5 by 14 3 yes and 2 no's multiplied by its entropy that is 0 0.971 and finally we'll take the sum of all of them which equals to 0 0.693 right next we'll calculate the information gained this what we did earlier was information taken from outlook now we are calculating what is the information we are gaining from outlook right now this information gain that equals to total entropy minus the information that is taken from outlook all right so total entropy we had 0 0.94 minus information we took from outlook is 0 0.693 so the value of information gained from outlook results to 0 0.247 all right so next what we have to do let's assume that wendy is our root node so wendy consists of two parameters false and true let's see how many yes and how many no's are there in case of true and false so when wendy has false as its parameter then in that case it has six yes and two no's and when it has true as its parameter it has three yes and three no's all right so let's move ahead and similarly calculate the information taken from wendy and finally calculate the information gained from wendy all right so first of all what we'll do we'll calculate the entropy of each feature starting with windy equal true so in case of true we had equal number of yes and equal number of no well remember the graph when we had the probability as 0 0.5 as total number of yes equal total number of no and for that case the entropy equals one so we can directly write entropy of true when it's windy is one as we had already proved it when probability equals 0 0.5 the entropy is the maximum that equals to one all right next is entropy of false when it is windy all right so similarly just put the probability of yes and no in the formula and then calculate the result since you have six yes and two no's so in total you'll get the probability of yes as six by eight and probability of no as two by eight all right so when you will calculate it you will get the entropy of false as 0 0.811 all right now let's calculate the information from windy so total information collected from windy equals information taken when windy equal true plus information taken when windy equal false so we'll calculate the weighted average for each one of them and then we'll sum it up to finally get the total information taken from windy so in this case it equals to 8 by 14 multiplied by 0 0.811 plus 6 by 14 multiplied by 1 what is this 8 it is total number of yes and no in case when windy equals false right so when it was false so total number of yes that equals to 6 and total number of no that equal to 2 that sum ups to 8 all right so that is why the weighted average results to 8 by 14. similarly information taken when windy equals true equals to 3 plus 3 that is 3 yes and 3 no equals 6 divided by total number of sample space that is 14 multiplied by 1 that is entropy of true all right so it is 8 by 14 multiplied by 0 0.811 plus 6 by 14 multiplied by 1 which results to 0 0.892 this is information taken from wendy all right now how much information you are gaining from wendy so for that what you'll do so total information gained from wendy that equals to total entropy minus information taken from wendy all right that is 0 0.94 minus 0 0.892 that equals to 0 0.048 so 0 0.048 is the information gained from Wendy. All right. Similarly, we calculated for the rest too. All right. So for Outlook, as you can see, the information was 0 0.693 and its information gain was 0 0.247. In case of temperature, the information was around 0 0.911 and the information gain that was equal to 0 0.029. In case of humidity, the information gain was 0.152 and in the case of Wendy, the information gain was 0.048. So what we'll do, we'll select the attribute with the maximum mode. Fine. Now we have selected Outlook as our root node and it is further subdivided into three different parts. Sunny, overcast and rain. So in case of overcast, we have seen that it consists of all yes. So we can consider it as a leaf node. But in case of sunny and rainy, it's doubtful as it consists of both yes and both no so you need to recalculate the things right again for this node you have to recalculate the things all right you have to again select the attribute which is having the maximum information gain all right so this is how your complete tree will look like all right so let's see when you can play 
So you can play when outlook is overcast. All right. In that case, you can always play. If the outlook is sunny, you will further drill down to check the humidity condition. All right. If the humidity is normal, then you will play. If the humidity is high, then you won't play. Right. When the outlook predicts that it's rainy, then further you'll check whether it's windy or not. If it has a weak wind, then you'll go and opt for play. But if it has strong wind, then you won't play. Right. So this is how your entire decision tree would look like at the end. All right. Okay, now comes the concept of pruning says that what should I do to play? Well, you have to do pruning pruning will decide how you will play. What is this pruning? Well, this pruning is nothing but cutting down the nodes in order to get the optimal solution. All right. So what pruning does it reduces the complexity. All right. As here you can see on the screen that it's showing only the result for yes. That is it's showing all the result which says that you can play. All right. Before we drill down to a practical session, a common question might come in your mind. You might think that a tree based model better than linear model, right? You can think like if I can use a logistic regression for classification problem and linear regression for regression problem then why there is a need to use the tree? Well, many of us have this question in their mind and well, there's a valid question too. Well, actually, as I said earlier, you can use any algorithm. It depends on the type of problem you're solving. Let's look at some key factor which will help you to decide which algorithm to use and when. So the first point being if the relationship between dependent and independent variable is well approximated by a linear model, then linear regression will outperform tree based model. Second case if there is a high nonlinearity and complex relationship between dependent and independent variables a tree model will outperform a classical regression model in third case if you need to build a model which is easy to explain to people a decision tree model will always do better than a linear model as the decision tree models are simpler to interpret than linear regression all right now let's move on ahead and see how you can write a decision tree classifier from scratch in Python using the cart algorithm. All right. For this, I'll be using Jupyter Notebook with Python 3.0 installed on it. All right. So let's open the Anaconda and the Jupyter Notebook. Where is that? So this is our Anaconda navigator, and I'll directly jump over to Jupyter Notebook and hit the launch button. I guess everyone knows that Jupyter Notebook is a web based interactive computing notebook environment where you can run your Python codes. So my Jupyter notebook it opens on my local host 8891. So I'll be using this Jupyter notebook in order to write my decision tree classifier using Python for this decision tree classifier. I have already written the set of codes. Let me explain you just one by one. So we'll start with initializing our training data set. So there's a sample data set for which each row is an example. The last column is a label and the first two columns are the features. If you want, you can add some more features and example for your practice. Interesting fact is that this data set is designed in a way that the second and the fifth example have almost the same features, but they have different labels. All right, so let's move on and see how the tree handles this case. As you can see here, both of them, the second and the fifth column, have the same features. What they differ in is just their label. Fine. So let's move ahead. So this is our training data set. Next, what we are doing, we are adding some column labels. So they are used only to print the trees. Fine. So what we'll do, we'll add header to the columns. Like the first column is of color, second is of diameter, and third is of label column. All right. Next, what we'll do, we'll define a function as unique values in which we'll pass the rows and the columns. So, this function, what it will do, it will find the unique values for a column in the data set. So, there's an example for that. So, what we are doing here, we are passing training data as our row and column number as zero. So, what we are doing, we are finding unique values in terms of color. And in this, since the row is training data and the column is one. So what you are doing here. So we are finding the unique values in terms of diameter fine. So this is just an example. Next what we'll do we will define a function as class count and we will pass the rows into it. So what it does it counts the number of each type of example within a data set. So in this function what we are basically doing we are counting the number of each type of example in the data set or what we are doing we are counting the unique values for the label in the data set. As a sample, you can see here we can pass that entire training data set to this particular function as class underscore count. What it will do, it will find all the different types of label within the training data set. As you can see here, the unique label consists of mango, grape, and lemon. So next, what we'll do, we'll define a function is numeric and we'll pass a value into it. So what it will do, 
it will just test if the value is numeric or not and it will return if the value is an integer or a float for example you can see is numeric we are passing 7 so it is an integer so it will return an int value and if you are passing red it's not a numeric value right so moving on ahead we'll define a class named as question so what this question does this question is used to partition the data set this class what it does it just records a column number for example 0 for color all right and a column value for example green next what we are doing we are defining a match method which is used to compare the feature value in the example to the feature value stored in the question let's see how first of all what we are doing we are defining an init function and inside that we are passing the self column and the value as parameter so next what we do we define a function as match what it does it compares the feature value in an example to the feature value in this question fine next we'll define a function as repr which is just a helper method to print the question in a readable format next what we are doing we are defining a function partition well this function is used to partition the data set each row in the data set it checks if it matches the question or not if it does so it adds it to the true rows or if not then it adds to the false rows all right for example as you can see here let's partition the training data set based on whether the rows are red or not here we are calling the function question and we are passing a value of 0 and red to it so what it will do it will assign all the red rows to true underscore rows and everything else will be assigned to false underscore rows fine next what we'll do we'll define a genuine impurity function and inside that we'll pass the list of rows so what it will do it will just calculate the genuine impurity for the list of rows next what we are doing here we're defining a function as information gain so what this information gain function does it calculates the information gain using the uncertainty of the starting node minus the weighted impurity of the child node the next function is find the best split well this function is used to find the best question to ask by iterating over every feature or value and then calculating the information gain for the detailed explanation on the code you can find the code in the description given below all right next we'll define a class as leaf for classifying the data it holds a dictionary of class like mango for how many times it appears in the row from the training data that reaches this leaf all right next is the decision node so this decision node it will ask a question this holds a reference to the question and to the two child nodes on the basis of it you are deciding which node to add further to which branch all right so next what we are doing we are defining a function of build tree and inside that we are passing our number of rows so this is the function that is used to build the tree so initially what we did we defined all the various function that we'll be using in order to build a tree so let's start by partitioning the data set for each unique attribute then we'll calculate the information gain and then return the question that produces the highest gain and on the basis of that we'll split the tree so what we are doing here we are partitioning the data set calculating the information gain and then what this is returning it is returning the question that is producing the highest gain all right now if gain equals zero return leaf arrows so what it will do so if we are getting no for the gain that is gain equals zero then in that case since no further question could be asked so what it will do it will return a leaf fine now true underscore rows or false underscore rows equal partition with rows and the question so if we are reaching till this position then you have already found a feature or value which will be used to partition the data set then what you will do you will recursively build the true branch and similarly recursively build the false branch so return decision underscore node and inside that will be passing question true branch and false branch so what it will do it will return a question node and this question node this records the best feature or the value to ask at this point fine now that we have built our tree next what we'll do we'll define a print underscore tree function which will be used to print the tree fine so finally what we are doing in this particular function that we are printing our tree next is the classify function which will use it to decide whether to follow the true branch or the false branch and then compare to the feature or value stored in the node to the example we are considering and last what we'll do we'll finally print the prediction at the leaf so let's execute it and see okay so this is our testing data all right so we printed our leaf as well now that we have trained our algorithm with our training data set now it's time to test it so this is our testing data set so let's finally execute it and see what is the result so this is the result you will get so first question which is asked by the algorithm is is diameter greater than equal to three if it is true then it will further ask if the color is yellow 
again if it is true then it will predict mango as one and lemon with one all right and in case it is false then it will just predict the mango now this was the true part now next coming to if diameter is not greater than or equal to three then in that case it's false and what it will do it will just predict the grape fine okay so this was all about the coding part now let's conclude this session but before concluding let me just show you one more thing now there's a scikit learn algorithm cheat sheet which explains you which algorithm you should use and when all right it's built in a decision tree format let's see how it is built so first condition it will check whether you have 50 samples or not if your samples are greater than 50 then it will move ahead if it is less than 50 then you need to collect more data if your sample is greater than 50 then you have to decide whether you want to predict a category or not if you want to predict a category then further you will see that whether you have labeled data or not if you have labeled data then that would be a classification algorithm problem if you don't have the labeled data then it would be a clustering problem now if you don't want to predict a category then what do you want to predict predict a quantity well if you want to predict a quantity then in that case it would be a regression problem if you don't want to predict a quantity and you want to keep looking further then in that case you should go for dimensionality reduction problems and still if you don't want to look and the predicting structure is not working then you have tough luck for that i hope this decision tree session clarifies all your doubt over decision tree algorithm so in case you have any doubt feel free to reach out at eureka's forum or add your query to the youtube's comment section thank you i hope you have enjoyed listening to this video please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to edureka channel to learn more happy learning